All right, everyone. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, as we have anybody else sign in, we can add them to the chat and get them caught up. Um, otherwise, let's get ahead and get started. Um, just a brief introduction. My name is Vanessa. I'm with the Fond du Lac County Historical Society. And today we are talking about Ray Thornton's Fond du Lac County. Now, how many of you know who Ray Thornton is? Either in the chat box or either in the chat box or with your audio. I do. Awesome. Great. So most of us are aware of who he is. Yes, a photographer. All right, well, we're gonna get the shared screen going here. Now pop up here. So um, your little task bar on the side, just a little bit of heads up that you can do a smaller size of the video of me over here. It's up to you if you want to have that there or not. Get the slide start here. All right. So we all know that Ray Thornton was a photographer. So we just want to get this started with a brief introduction about who Ray Thornton is. Now, Ray Thornton was very active in the Fond du Lac community. Um, for many, many years, and with the Fond du Lac County Historical Society. He served on our board of directors and was one of our early presidents. Um, he also was involved with the Professional Photographers of America for nearly 40 years, which is an extremely long amount of time. Um, and he also was involved with a lot of uh, the collections that we have today on, at the Thornton Library, and of course, it's named after him and his wife, Mildred. And in that collection, we now have over 20,000 photos of Fond du Lac County residents, places, and history, which is just a great resource to have. Um, he also did a lot of work for local businesses. Um, a highlight of that is the Mohawker, which was the quarterly newsletter, monthly newsletter for the um, Fred Rooping Company. And of course, Rooping Leather, they made leather products. And this newsletter was some a way for their employees to keep track of what was new with their coworkers. And so they would have announcements in there about who was getting married, who had a baby, different stuff like that. And uh, it was a fun way to connect with other um, members of this larger company. Um, and so he published two books. Now I've got one good photo here. Um, I don't have one of the second volume, but his first volume was published in 1977. Um, he had a goal to help preserve local history through photography. Now, again, this was a lifelong passion for him, and he saw the value in, that, in these photos and how they could tell us stories about the people of Fond du Lac. Um, so the first edition was very well received, um, sold like hot hotcakes, and there was a like, great demand for a second volume. And he did create one of those in 1981, um, and that is A Photographer's History of Fond du Lac County, Volume 2, and that one is blue. So oftentimes you'll hear us refer to them as the red book and the blue book, because that's the simplest way to keep them straight. Um, but both books have over 300 pages and over 500 photos, um, ranging from still shots of landscapes here in the county to individuals and businesses and what the happenings were in town at that time. And it isn't just downtown Fond du Lac, though there is a lot of city of Fond du Lac photos in there. He took a wide variety of photos and collected a lot of photos as well. Not all the photos were taken by uh, Mr. Thornton. It was one, one of those things where he collaborated with a lot of other community members to scan in and to share their photos. Now you can see here an example of what it looks like inside the book. And he worked closely with local historian Ruth Shaw Worthing um, to get a lot of these labels for these photos. Because of course, if you take a look at them, if you weren't having a label underneath, 
you wouldn't know what those photos were. And not all photos get labeled. Um, that's something we preach a lot today is that we encourage folks to go through their own family photos and document what these places, people, and things are. And that way for future generations, it's much easier to understand what the place was and what it was about. So as you can see here, these photos are from the Rosendale Township. And talking a little bit about Samuel Sanborn, who is one of the first residents of the area there. And uh, talking about the different locations. So you can see there's a couple of photos of Highway 23. There's some other businesses in Rosendale. And of course, in the bottom right corner, there is the 4th of July parade. Um, it's always one of those things that it's fun to see what people were seeing and experiencing during these different times. Now, the first book, volume one, really focuses on pre-1920s photos. So a lot of these are historic photos that have been collected, postcards, things like that. The second volume was a little bit more modern. Most things were post-World War II um, and kind of gave us an idea of what downtown used to look like. All right, so I'm gonna ask you guys what you think is going on in this photo. There's quite a few people there. And I can see a horse in the background, or a couple of horses if you look really close. What do you think they're doing? Oh, I'm missing the chat here. I'm guessing you said that it was ice car cutting. So ice cutting was a very big business here in Fond du Lac, especially during the turn of the century between the 1880s and the 1900. Um, it was very popular because Lake Winnebago was wide enough and got iced over fast enough that they could supply the demands for ice in other parts of the state and even down in Chicago. So with the railroad lines being set up in the 1860s and 1870s, they were able to easily transport the massive blocks of ice out of the area to places where they needed it. And as you can see, they had quite a few people working on this job. It was a very dangerous job because you could easily fall in the lake and get hypothermia. Um, but it was something that was a great way for farmers to make extra money during the winter season when they weren't able to farm. The next one here is um, a parade. And you can see here, there's a lot of neat details. Now we know it's a 4th of July parade, but do you see anything that stands out that you think is kind of cool? And I'm gonna try to shift this so I can. They're using a horse to pull people. That's, That's right. right, they're using, they're using a, using a wagon. wagon. Someone said it was a wagon. <laughs> Looks like a railroad company. Yes, yes it, is it is the Sioux the line. line. And the Sioux Line was a very big business in North Fond du Lac. And they were in business through the 1970s. Are those boxes of cereal in the background? Toasted corn flakes? Yup. Yep. <laughs> So, so you can, you can see, see that, that even, even during, during the 4th of, of July, the work did not stop. stop. <laughs> and you can, and you can see, see that they've got their flakes up there. Up there. And, if and if you were, you were really, really close, close and see those photos for in your, in your bird's eye there, you would probably notice that it only has 48 or 49 stars because this was before Hawaii and um, Alaska became states. So this was something that you wouldn't see very often in that regard. And then do you also see that 
they have on the side of the building, they have kind of what looks like a giant drum hanging off the side of the wall. Now that is a street sign that would have been used to promote a business. Um, up until about the mid 20th century, a lot of people didn't learn how to read and write. So to help them figure out what business they needed to go to, they would business owners would hang signs out in front of their storefront that would be a in the shape of or as a design of whatever business that they had. So you might see one that is eyeglasses for a optician. You might see one that's a bottle for a bar or tavern. Um, and those kind of things would help people that weren't able to necessarily read the sign, be able to get a gist about what the place was about and what they were selling. The next one here is a more modern photo. I believe this one was taken in either the 1920s or 1930s, and it is of the Crouch's Mill, which was the first building built in Campbellsport. Grist mills were often one of the first places a or first businesses in a remote area because they could process the wood that a lot of these pioneers were cutting down and they could also use it as a way to grind corn or wheat for flour and so or cornmeal and those would be important aspects of making your food during that time so it'd be a very valuable and very economical resource for a pioneer or settler to have. Um, so you'd often see them pop up before even houses or restaurants or anything else would arrive in a place because that's where people wanted to be was near the mill. Now what do you guys think is happening in this photo? It's a little unique. Is it a flood? That's right, it is a flood. Now you can see that it's a pretty deep flood because it's already about two feet up on downtown Fond du Lac. But you can see these guys are having some fun and making the most of the experience. Now flooding has been happening in the Fond du Lac, city of Fond du Lac for years, hundreds of years. And uh, that is due to our location being right on Lake Winnebago and the marshy areas there, as well as being building our downtown super close to the river. And of course, the river jams up in the when we get spring, when the ice starts melting off the lake. And flooding has always been a big concern. But you can see here some of the background pieces tell us a little bit more about what years this was. So you can see in the back there is a um, overhang on the building that says JJ Fox Groceries. Now grocery stores and grocery as a term wasn't a very popular thing until about 1900 so we know it's after that. We know the date is somewhere near May 31st because if you look in the far back there's a window with a sign in it that says May 31st. You can see that there's a mix of buildings that some are stone or some are brick and some are made out of wood. So that tells you that there are different structures there. And you can see the Perline sign in the back. Now Perline was something related to cars. So that puts us post the 1910s. So after doing a little bit of digging, we found this photo was actually from 1924. You can kind of see with the boys' outfits too that that would be kind of your typical outfit for a boy of that age during the 1920s. Next photo we have here is the bus depot. Now, how many of you recognize where this location is today? It's still around. That's the Rhett Law. That's right. It's right next to the Rhett Law. And you can kind of see where the rolled up curtains are for the front of the restaurant in downtown there. Yeah. And so they, they had buses there for quite a few years and it was the way of transporting people around town. And again, the buses are much different than our buses today. 
especially in the looks. You can see here we've got a couple of photos of um, winter here in Wisconsin. And you can see how the bus and the train lines were dealing with those issues. In the top photo, they're working on clearing the snow in front of the um, Chicago Northwestern Depot. Now there was a number of train lines that came through Fond du Lac throughout the years. Um, it was a very, they all started back in the 1840s when they were trying to figure out what gauge of train to use. And since you could choose for your railroad company what gauge you wanted to use, they put different types of gauges and different types of um, trains all over the state of Wisconsin. Because all trains at that point were privately funded. So you could say, well, I prefer this size. I think that's better. And so it created a lot of these railroad routes that are still in use today. And then you see in the lower photo, the orange line bus at the depot. Now that's kind of a strange looking bus compared to your school bus or your city bus today. Um, they probably would only fit about, I would say anywhere from 15 to 20 people if you squeezed real tight. And uh, you can actually see different buses like this out at Yellowstone Park today. They sometimes do tours in those in the winter months, but it's definitely something that has gone to the past. One fine highlight of this photo as well is if you look at the top of the bus in the back, there looks kind of like a roof rack. And the reason was for that was if you were traveling and you had suitcases, you would have to tie them to the top of the bus. So you definitely have to trust your driver not to lose your suitcase while you're heading to your destination. The next photo here is of the Galloway House and Village. Now, as you probably noticed, it looks a little different than it does today. Um, the reason for that is this photo was taken in 1977. So this was taken um, shortly after many of these buildings had been brought to the site and they had been recently restored and repaired. Um, you can kind of see that we have two different pathways versus the one we have now. Um, though we still have these buildings and those two big beautiful oak trees in the backdrop there. And so Ray was a really big supporter of local history. As you could see with the photos before and with his two books, he was really passionate about making sure that these photos were preserved and that people could see them and experience it. Because there's lots of different ways to learn, whether it's by hearing, by seeing, by smelling, by trying something. And it's important that we include the visual aspect. And it kind of allows us to step back in time a little bit and picture what life was like for people during these eras in Fond du Lac. Now, this is one of my favorite photos from the book. Um, this is Judy and Bill Benson, taken at Benson's Hideaway, and that's on the north end of Long Lake near Dundee. This was in his second book in 1981. Uh, you can see that they're sitting out on, standing out on a pontoon out onto the lake. Now, Long Lake has been a recreational area for many, many years, and uh, Benson's Hideaway has gotten some national coverage over the years and made Fond du Lac on the map because of its alien sightings. Now, it's kind of silly, but there have been several reported sightings of UFOs and unidentified lights over the lake and over Dundee Mountain, which is a large hill right by the lake. And uh, so it's brought quite a bit of enthusiasts, some TV shows and other groups to come in and investigate and try to figure out what's going on. But you can go to Bill Benson's hideaway and he can talk to you about his experiences with it. But I always like to share about that too, that Fond du Lac has a little weird side as well. Now, since Ray was a big collector of photos, he also collected cameras. Now, with photography, it has changed significantly since the start of the 1800s. So at first they had some very rudimentary photo camera um, technology that would be very fuzzy and very hard to read. 
And as they went on over time, you can see how they changed from having kind of an accordion shape and having to have on a stand to something that was more portable, having flash, which today most people don't use flash with their photos, but especially during the times before we had our modern lighting, it was very important to have your flash, otherwise you wouldn't be able to see anything in your photo. And the way we process photos is a change to a lot too. Um, traditionally, they were made with a film that would have to be processed with chemicals and be laid out. And then of course, in the 1970s, brought around the lovely Polaroid camera, which is still around today, though not as widely used. And that's the instant camera where it print right on there. You just have to shake it and there's your photo. But today we have the digital option. So you can see in the lower middle photo that there's some options there of some more telephoto lenses and more fancy cameras. And you can get cameras as big and as fancy and as detailed as you'd like. But most cameras today are digital so that everything goes onto an SD card. Upload it to your computer and you can print them that way. Um, you don't have to go through all the work of processing them in a dark room and using all sorts of chemicals and things like that. So it's definitely improved our convenience. What's also helped with convenience is the smartphone. Now, most of us have one of these hanging around at home. Mine's kind of going in invisible with the house, but, <laughs> um, but smartphones are an, a great adaption to the phone, the camera as well. Um, can't, you're starting to see phones that have three, four cameras on the back of the phone. And so it's an important part of how we save our history and how we share our experiences with each other. And even today in media, photos and videos are an important aspect of how we share information and convey stories. Um, and these photos that Ray was able to capture and to save are going to be helping us to share Fond du Lac's story for generations to come. All right, guys, that brings us to the end of the presentation there. Do you guys have any questions? Are Ray's photo books available for purchase? Are they still in print? Yes, we have both of them for print, in print and available in our gift shop. Um, we're still working out with all of the COVID-19 things, how we want to um, sell those online, but we're hoping to be able to offer those up again soon. We also have Ruth Shaw Worthing's book, Fond du Lac by its place names. Now it's a little different than this one where there's no, not a lot of pictures, but it does go through the history a lot of a lot of our um, historic places and our historic roads and talking about why different places are named they, the way they are. That sounds neat. Any other questions, guys? No, but thank you very much. This has been like a trip down memory lane. Ray used to take us when we'd come to visit, Ray and Mildred would take us out to Bill Benson's for dinner. So we'd have Aunt Ida in her wheelchair and Ray and Mildred, we'd all be around the table and then Bill would come over to chat with them. Oh, fine. Bill, Bill is a great guy and it's a really interesting place to visit when you're there. And they actually have recently started doing um, these alien days where you can come in and you can see all these different things related to these so-called alien sightings in Dundee. And you can see for yourself if you think they're real or not. All right, guys, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, the recording for this will be up sometime next week. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Bye, guys. Bye.